before I go to jail, I want to have some fun for a while and have freedom for a while because I, because but I'm gonna they're gonna put me in jail for sure. I know that because it's my third time. <laughs> In the North, the majority of the people have had imposed upon them a legal system, together with other institutions that uh, really are the product of Euro-Canadian society. And they haven't had much choice in it. The way the white people see the crime, they will automatically label him or her as a criminal, whereas the Inuit would prefer to seek ways of forgiving. This is the second time when they charged me for that girl. I didn't do anything sexual assaulted her or something like that. When they charged me, other policemen told me that it wasn't serious. I'm just a little nervous, a bit nervous, a bit scared. I hope it's, I don't know, I just want to get it over with. Are you nervous about the court coming up? Oh, yeah. Why are you nervous? Because uh, I might go to correctional center for three or six months or more. It's boring. It's hell. I'm not really nervous about it. I deserve it or something because of Kalunak's law, not Inuit law, white man's law. Things like homicide, assault, theft are probably seen as crimes by people anywhere in the world. However, they all would deal differently with what they do about it. And of course, we have a very elaborate procedure developed over centuries to try a person who's accused. And our procedures are very, very much a product of our society. Order all rise. Territorial court is now in session. Good morning, please be seated. In the court, you have the Crown Prosecutor and the defending lawyer. But it all comes down to two lawyers fighting. 
To us, it just looks like white people doing their jobs, trying to make a living. To me, as an Inuk, this system makes no sense. Sapujiyi, Desmond Bryce Bennett, Amalu Francis Piugatuk, Pasiksiyi, Louise Charbonneau, Tusad Utit Avani. You see the same people come before the court, circuit after circuit, uh, sometimes charged with the same kinds of things. Um, it's, it's the, 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 the word that comes to mind is sad more than anything else. Uh, it can be frustrating. Uh, after a prosecution when, when you're unsuccessful, to see the same person be charged again with something different because you always wonder, well, what, what could I have done the last time to prevent this new thing from happening? Mr. Bryce Bennett, are you going to be representing Mr. Kayak? Uh, Your Honor, initially this was a charge of um, Section 87. However, I've had uh, discussions with Ms. Charbonneau since the uh, Crown is proceeding summarily, uh, Mr. Francis Piogatuk, our court worker, will be representing Gordy Kayak. It says in this report that you threatened the RCMP officer with the knife when he tried to take it away from you. Is this statement true? That's not what really happened. According to this criminal code, anyone using a weapon, real or fake, to endanger someone can be tried on charges of possession of a dangerous weapon, which is quite a serious charge. You could be imprisoned for up to 10 years, and they could take away your hunting rifle for another 10 years. We are here to defend you, and we can fight these charges. But I talked to the Crown Prosecutor about your case. And if you are willing to plead guilty, the charge will be reduced from possession of a weapon dangerous to the public peace to simple assault of a police officer. The clerk will read the charge as amended. Mr. Kayak, stand up, please. Gordon Kayak, you're charged on or about the 31st day of October, 1993, at or near the hamlet of Clyde River in the Northwest Territories, did assault Michael Robert Jeffrey, a peace officer engaged in the execution of his duties, contrary to Section 270, subsection 2 of the Criminal Code. Crown election, do you understand the charge? How do you plead to this charge? Guilty. My dad used to be an alcoholic. Uh, he used to come home drunk, beat my mother up and myself. And I grew up being scared of him, afraid to talk to him, even look at him. Uh, one night, uh, my girlfriend and I, we were arguing. And my dad said something to my girlfriend. And, and in her defense, I said something to my dad. In her defense? Yeah, yeah and something happened. Um, I know we just had an argument, my dad, myself. That, that night, we, that night we, st we finally started talking after about 18 years of silence. I just touched her, like, 
like any any way when we love our children they just touch touch her while she was sleeping I just touch her and my girlfriend she charged me sexual assault for her daughter that's not my daughter I touch her down there while she was sleeping I just touch her like this that's all and she she saw me she saw me that I just touch her my girlfriend even think that I licked her it's really hard for women or men who have gone through abuse to go up into the court and testify and that nothing's happened because court takes a long time to start like if something happened now a person will be in the court maybe two years later mm. when the woman is starting to heal mm. the police and the justice system only seem to look for evidence witness and proof they don't listen to our pain seems like bna and property is more important than lives that they destroyed. There are a number of communities scattered around the Northwest Territories, approximately 50, I think. The courts are established in Yellowknife and in Iqaluit. Instead of bringing people to those two centers, both the territorial court and the Supreme Court travel to each of these communities on circuit. The territorial court travels on a scheduled basis to all of the 13 communities in the region, visiting each community from four times a year to, in a couple of cases, twice a year. I came north initially for what was supposed to be 18 months, and I'm still here. That's four and a half years. It's a real life, real people kind of work. The difficulties we encounter in, in establishing a rapport and, and a trust relationship with, with a complainant, of course, is compounded by, by cultural and language difficulties. Uh, I don't speak Inuktitut, so when I'm in the bath and a lot of times, I have to speak to people with the assistance of an interpreter. It's very difficult to, to show empathy and to have that come across. I had problems with my girlfriend. Me and her got a daughter and a son. Our, our son had to go to Iqlu because of medical reasons and there's a bar at the Iqluit, and up here in Panlet, there's no bar here. And she started going to bars and started drinking, all that. And when she, when she was at the bar, she found somebody else. And we broke up all that. And I started, I started having problems. That case is related to number 13, Jason, who's also charged with trafficking. Basically, what, what seems to have happened here is that one of the two that are now living in Iqaluit um, purchased about an ounce of hash. And uh, all that Jason did was carry it up. And he was asked, you know, by an older relative to do it. I think it would be very difficult for him to say no. Is that illegal to carry it up? <laughs> I, understand, uh, I understand the law frowns upon that, uh, Neil. But what I'm hoping is we might be able to persuade uh, Louise that it's a good case for diversion. He has no record. He's a pretty good kid. You are my sun. You are my moon. Without you, I live in darkness. You are my smile. You are my laughter. Without you, I live in sadness. 
You are my passion. You are my ecstasy. Without you, I wouldn't have love. You are my guide. You are my sight. Without you, I am blind. You are my heart. You are my soul. Without you, I don't have life. You guys plan to marry? We're not sure yet. We'll see. Did you say that you're going to be a father? Yeah. Do you hope it's a boy or a girl? I hope it's a girl. Oh, hey, girl. I don't know. I just like, I, I just want a daughter. I used to get beaten up by my ex-boyfriend, Jason. It was like that for three years. I always talked to my mom about it, but she never said anything. So I left him. He stopped going to school. He never did anything. He just stayed in his room because he really wanted me back. I felt sorry for him, but I didn't want to go back to him. Uh, last time he wanted to go back was just a couple of months ago. He was drunk, and we talked for two hours. I, I still love him, but I still care about him. But I don't want him back, because it might happen again. The beating up might happen again. When the whites find out about a crime, their way is to lock up the offender, to put him behind closed doors. Our way is to encourage him to talk about it. And if he does, we see this as a sign that he is willing to change. I think the most common questions that young people have are basically three. Maybe I'll write them on the board for you. The first one, in English, is, who am I? I think that is the most common question that arises, especially when people start to know English. The questions that follow are, what am I? What am I? What am I, and why do I get into trouble? It is important to know Gordy's background in order to see where it is led After his grandfather died, his biological mother died. And not from natural causes, either. She died from massive injuries received in a beating. His uncle lost his mind and was placed in a mental institution down south with the white people. Gordy's cousin that he grew up with has a serious addiction problem, and his cousin's mother died from alcohol-related causes. This is the kind of life that Gordy has known. Uh, then there's the um, there's this trial, the, the sexual assault trial that started on the last circuit when you were there, and the file says that it's for continuation. Where where is that at? Okay, that this is uh, this matter involves uh, yeah, the the videotaped uh, uh, statement by that uh, by that young girl. On the last circuit, uh, we had a voir dire. Uh, right. to determine whether this statement uh, could be admissible. But the voir dire is finished? That's right. Okay, so we get the decision and we continue the trial? Exactly. I learned from my parents that when I was growing up, they used to kiss me down there. So the Inuit kiss babies' genitals? Yeah, all the time. Maybe up to nine years old, they were still kissing me down there. My mother and my father, even my sisters. I remember even my sisters kissed me down there before, even in front of everybody, uh, in the middle of daytime or in the morning, in front of everybody. It's not sexual at all. Are you going to plead not guilty? I'll try. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I didn't do, I didn't do any sexual assault to her. Oh, well, only if Desmond wants me to say that. If Desmond wants you to plead guilty, you will? Mm-hmm, yeah. He's a lawyer, eh? 
It's uh, sometimes suggested that there are cultural defenses to sexual assault up here. There are just one or two situations in which there may be what appears to be a cultural defense. But in actual fact, I think that if the people who had been laying the charge in the first place had been better informed, they wouldn't be laying a charge because they wouldn't perceive it as a sexual assault. And what I'm talking about is uh, uh, the way in which Inuit mothers particularly, in some areas, um, show affection to their children, babies usually, uh, by saying endearing things to them and, and by kissing them uh, in a completely non-sexual way in the genital area. And that, um, you could call that a, a cultural defense, if you like, to sexual assault. But in, in my opinion, if you, if you knew the people and, and saw the scene, you would know right away whether, in fact, um, there was anything untoward about it. It's a cultural thing that I understand. Like, I know it happens in my immediate family, but for my brother or my nephew to, get, to see him kiss my son's genitals, I don't think I could accept that. What if it's a father or a stepfather? Stepfather, I don't accept. I don't think. Father, I can relate. We knew sexual childhood abuse. It's very, very, very bad inside, inside and here. I even wanted to kill myself. Ah. Gordy uh, was drinking heavily on the night that I met him and uh, he was having uh, problems with his girlfriend and mostly with his wife and uh, he was in a crisis situation and that's when I met him. He uh, met him outside and at that time he had a knife in his hand and he was threatening to kill himself. And his actions uh, were dangerous not only to himself but now to me because I was face to face with him. He did approach me with a knife pointing it at me and pretending he was going to throw it at me and there was some danger there. Uh, however, I felt I could get away from the situation without having to resolve to any uh, physical violence. And after a brief conversation we had, I was able to uh, convince him to put down his knife and uh, because he was extremely intoxicated, we, uh, for his safety, he ended up having to spend the night in uh, jail. Part of the circumstances relating to this offense was an attempted suicide on your part or threatening or gesturing of suicide? Okay. And uh, was that the first time? No. I tried it once. Is that right? Mm -hmm. what, what, what exactly did you do? Uh, grab a gun or... Is that right? Hmm. Uh, not too, not too many attempt suicides with a gun. Eh? I assume you didn't uh, discharge it. You didn't shoot yourself, but uh, you felt like it at least once. Eh? I think that last year we had a record year for suicide in the NWT, and we're on our way to another one this year. And that uh, it tells me that everything that we've done in the past probably isn't working. No, maybe not as well as it should. So that means there are no more rules and have to move on and keep trying something else. Okay, well, let's play for acquittals and convictions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's very good. Nothing. Probably a bit ambitious, but... I'm an ambitious girl! Oh, <laughs> well, you only have one left. He has the look of a karate kid. 
Yeah, oh, but oh that's it. Oh, it's, yes. It's well, appearances. We, oh, yes. Appearances. Yes. Yes. All that this. Desmond, this still might I be, take it all back. All the things I did. Oh, no. Look at what I did. Oh, Make yes. <laughs> Anything I've ever said about you being overly adversarial, you were actually playing feminist pool. You're feminist pool. Oh, this is feminist pool. Because I know that you're going to be conciliatory and um, <laughs> fair and just. <laughs> yes. Oh, victory. Yes. 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 Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so I know we're gonna have a good circuit. Now. That's all right. Yeah. I think. I think, it's, I think the tone. I think the tone has been set. The tone has been set. <laughs> you help me. I help you. You scratch my back. <laughs> Well, I think it's probably time for a, what do you call it? Uh, drink? Yeah. <laughs> kids drink that? Yeah. That's hairspray? Yeah, they do, kid, but I don't do it. Actually, this is actually to make a deal with me. And what do you get? Hash. Hash? Yeah. And what do they get? This, this bottle. And when they drink it, what happens? You get drunk, kind of. Like, if you pour, if you pour some here and add it with water, that's how you get higher. travel about once every three weeks and yes sometimes you get very tired of traveling uh, it's part of the job and it was known to me when I took the job so it's not something you can complain about but sometimes it's hard to be away from home when my kids have special things at school the circuit system is sometimes criticized as being fly-in fly-out court and it is true that court stays in each place only as long as is necessary to deal with the cases before it. Because there is a schedule to be kept to. There are a lot of communities to visit. So there are these constraints and these pressures that do tend at times to make it appear as if we are rushing. We, as a court party, fly everywhere together. The costs of flying separately would be prohibitive for the most part. We try very hard and I hope we're successful in maintaining our independence and our distance once we arrive in a community. I hope communities understand the roles of each of us and how those roles fit together. Uh, so even if they see us together sometimes, I believe that they understand that we're not discussing cases outside of court and what my role as a judge is. I think they're in the all same team, e even, even the defending lawyer too. You think they're all on the same team? Hello. Hi. Is James living here? Where is he living at now? Next door to Jacob, Peter Lucy's house. They're still looking for me. They're going to find me for sure. Because this place is a very small town. That's why they're going to find me for sure. Are you going to try to hide for a while? Before Monday, yeah. <laughs> you going to hide till Monday? Uh, yeah, I'm planning to. I'm going to let them catch me on Monday because, it's, because this coming Tuesday, it's going to be cold day. So this Monday, I'm going to let them catch me because this weekend, I got plans. Well, he's not aware of the fact that uh, until we actually went out and started going door to door that uh, he'd be aware that we were looking for him. Uh, now that uh, we have been doing that, uh, it'll be a little bit harder to find. So it's going to be one of these cases. He's going to be out walking. We happen to see him and just pick him up off the street. By the way, do you know when they take their coffee break? Yeah. When? 10 o'clock and 3 o'clock. 
most of the time they go to a hotel. Well, what are you going to do this weekend? Party or go camping, something like that. But you want to be caught before the court date? Yeah. And uh, we ended up picking them up later on, uh, on Friday, actually. There was a few complaints that came in about James, so we picked him up, and uh, he'll be in court tomorrow morning. This is really too bad. I'm sure Brad's going to die tomorrow, because tomorrow's Friday. Well, what's wrong with Brad? Brad had a heart attack in bed <laughs> with Lauren. Yeah. He was in bed with Lauren, but I thought Brad was pretty young and healthy and vigorous. Well, so did Lauren. <laughs> 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 that is shocking. I know that Jill Abbott is back with John Abbott, but he has psychological impotence, so she's sort of doing things with the handyman, who's also sleeping with Nikki Newman, Victor's ex-wife. And Victor's going to marry the blind woman because she's going to recover her sight. <laughs> And what else is going on? I tried to shoot myself. That was the same time when I tried, when I wanted to shoot my father. We were in an outpost camp for five years. I didn't like it very much. And I think that was the beginning that my father was going bad at me. I saw my father walking. He was walking on the beach. When I saw him, hatred just gets into my feelings. And I said to myself, oh, I wish you were dead. So I took the gun. I pointed to his head. Pointed to his head. Bang! <laughs> I bet you, I bet you we have more uttering threats charges in the Northwest Territories than we have anywhere else in this country. Anytime anybody says to anybody else, I wish I could kill you, <laughs> somebody presses a charge, right? But down south, they just think that's life. When I couldn't do it, I just get cried. Cry, cry, having tears, talking to myself. Why, why me? Why did I have to be born? All those things and other things. Did you ever tell him what had happened? Oh, yes. Eight years later. You told him that you almost killed him? Mm hmm After that, when I finished talking to him, I just... Just keep continuing crying, and he just hugged me. He just hugged me. He told me that he loved me. We all have to share the blame. That is the only way for us to go forward. It was thought that the young had to have an education in order to work. Because of the need for education, we were taken into one community. If we'd realized we were trying to turn into white people, then it would have been different. We elders are also to blame because we didn't teach our youth the traditional knowledge. We were confused about what was needed. That's why we should seek the forgiveness of the young people, but I don't know how you'd go about it. I, I learned the traditional song that I sing from an elder, Elisabi Utuva. And um, she passed it on to me um, on a tape, saying that, here, now you sing it, I pass it on to you. Yes. 
I'm convinced the statistics that you see on crime for the North tell a skewed picture. I think that if you did, for example, police every thousand Canadians with uh, a couple of policemen, as we in effect do, say, in this community, that it's likely that you would see crime statistics rise dramatically because they're in a position then to know the people that they're policing quite intimately and individually. And they're also much more accessible to people who want to make complaints. Can you just describe how the police approached? Um, we just broke into the house and said, um, this is a bust. And right away he handcuffed Tommy and his brother. Then he started searching the house. But Kevin told him where the, um, the narcotics was. Uh, he gave all of it and the money. Okay, so they brought you straight to the police station? Yeah. And what happened to you once you were at the police station? I had to wait in the jail cell. I wanted to call a lawyer. He tried giving me a list of lawyers, but I asked him if I could call you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And did he say anything to that? I'm not sure. I don't remember that part. I mean, uh, he was confusing me with words. The normal penalty for trafficking, unfortunately, is a term of imprisonment. There are some pretty important things going for you in this case. Mm -hmm. You have no record. You just graduated recently from school. You want to go to college, uh, according to what you've told me already. So it would be a real pity, you know, for you to have a criminal record. What I'd really like to try is asking the Crown whether they would be prepared to bypass the court system completely, divert you, that's the expression they use, off to the local committee of elders and some of the same people that sit on the Youth Justice Committee. From our perspective, there, there are two uh, types of diversion. And uh, the first uh, is where we deal with a specific case and uh, we make the decision as to whether or not um, the individual should be diverted to a committee who deals with alternative measures. And then the, the second level would be in the Crown's case where a charge is already laid um, and then it goes before the court and then the Crown deals with it and then they make a decision based on a number of factors whether or not it should be diverted to, uh, to uh, the alternative measures committee. The charge will usually be adjourned to the next circuit to give a chance to the person to go and meet with the elders, who can be some of the people who are in court helping the judge. The elders are getting used to coming to court, and they're getting comfortable with that process. And I'm not sure what the next step will be in terms of making the court and the community work closer together. After the lawyers are finished talking, uh, the elders are invited to make suggestions to me about what they feel might be included in the sentence to try and figure out a way um, without putting people into custody to get some of the young people out onto the land to teach them the traditional skills. If they can commit crime, they can serve their time. Maybe if they start being 
punished in Inuit way. If they, you know, if they don't want to lose their Inuit culture, maybe if they start being uh, sentenced in Inuit way, maybe they'll learn their lesson then. But with this white man's world, you know, they're saying, oh, poor Inuit, you know, they don't know white man's law. When they used to punish them, you know, they leave them out there to see if they can survive. And today, you know, they're sent to Iqaluit, to Baffin Correctional Center. Three months for stealing $10,000. That's not justice. Your Honor, the Crown is alleging criminal with regard to this charge, the sentence is suspended. Your Honor, this matter, we had hoped uh, we'd be in a position to uh, withdraw the charge today. We're asking for a further adjournment. Uh, Your Honor, uh, I'll just read out the convictions and the dates and the sentences. Your Honor, the Crown has decided. I think when it comes to sentencing, that's where our imagination seems to fail us. And we seem to have very few options that we consider, jails, uh, fines, matter, probation. Yeah, and uh, apart probably from the odd person who's really dangerous and from whom the community needs to be protected, I don't think that people here see much point in sending people to jail. How do you feel about your sentence? Do you feel that it was fair? I think it was fair. Why? It was, it was only a couple months, not a year. It's only a few months. You thought maybe they'd send you to jail for a longer time? Yeah, I thought, yeah. How long did you think they would send you away for? One, two years, one to two years. <laughs> so three months sounds pretty good? Yeah, sounds pretty good. I can't see how sending James Agnetsiak to jail today was of any value whatsoever to him or to anybody else. A great part of the time, sending people to jail is the most stupid, useless waste of time, expensive waste of time. I agree that you need jails for some people, particularly if they're dangerous or if they just become an absolute interminable nuisance. But most of the time, I think it is absurd. Apologize for the fact that they are attractive. We shouldn't have to stand behind some sort of a curtain. Mr. Kayak, stand up, please. Do you want to say anything in court today? The cop uh, arrested me. Uh, he said it's not a serious charge. And he told me he, he could help me in the court, but he, could, he couldn't make any promises. I'll invite the elders to say something to you if they want to. Mrs. Utuva, do you want to say something to this young man? The elders want people to behave. In this respect, there's no difference between us and the RCMP. You don't listen to us. You don't listen to the adults, or the elders, or the RCMP officers. You are lucky. They could have been very harsh with you. Hurting other people physically is not going to do anything for your relationship with a woman. This kind of behavior doesn't bring people together, and a woman who is treated to the kind of behavior your girlfriend witnessed will end up holding back from you out of fear.
In the past, whenever problems came up, we would blame the white people, or we would blame the young for their lack of knowledge. Now, we elders need to take responsibility and admit that we too made mistakes. There are many reasons for this, but I can think primarily of three. We stood by when the white people brought all of their changes in different ways with them. We neglected our children, and we seriously abused alcohol. Therefore, I think we should apologize to our young people. Perhaps then we can get closer to them. A long time ago, a shaman helped locate a lost party of young people who'd gone hunting. They'd been missing for a year. And their families went to the shaman and asked him to use his powers to find the young people. They respected the shaman. He had all the good powers within him. The shaman agreed and told them to begin by binding him with a sealskin rope and then to leave him alone behind a curtain in an igloo. All the people gathered outside the curtain with their eyes closed, waiting, waiting for the shaman to reach his destination. Then all of a sudden, they heard sounds, a swooshing sound through the air. The shaman was crying. Which direction? Which direction? Where am I going to go? Then the people settled down, and the shaman began to speak. I have seen the young people you are seeking. They are alive, and there is still time to find them. If the sentence is suspended, you will be on probation for 10 months, during the time of the probation order, you must keep the peace and be of good behavior. You will attend with the Tunit group regularly while you're in Pond Inlet. It's important that you go to those meetings. Under the probation order as well, you will get out hunting as often as possible. It may be that there's some people in town who need some of these young and strong.
you wish you could go back to the old ways? Yeah, I wish. Yeah. Do you think it's possible? I don't think so. I don't think so. No, it's not possible anymore. There's cracks in here? Come on, who's in the okay? After that long winter, a spring hunting party went out to search for the surviving young people. They took a shortcut through this area here. They were found just as the shaman had described, though their appearances and dress had changed. Most of the youth had indeed survived. Please. 